Okay, it, okay. Is the lapar uh, laparoscopic excision um, uh, a difficult surgery, and what percentage of success do you Laparoscopic excision of endometriosis uh, with sharp dissection uh, is fairly difficult surgery, and it's not surgery for everybody. You, I don't think you can practice obstetrics, for instance, and do endometriosis surgery. The surgery can take up to three and a half to four hours to over the ureter. Uh, you, you get the sense uh, at many times during the surgery that you're uh, on the brink of disaster, and yet you know, if you give up, that patient is going to be uh, left with the disease in the pelvis, and you, you may have failed to relieve her pain. So it's physically and mentally challenging. Um, the laparoscopic excision techniques are the exact same techniques that are used at laparotomy for removal of the disease. The only difference being the size of the incision, the size of the graspers, the size of the scissors. They're, they're much smaller, of course. Um, but it's not, it's not surgery that everybody is going to be able to do. There's about a uh, three to four year learning curve before a, before a physician can feel comfortable handling a lot of different kinds of cases. Uh, currently, I can handle about 75% of all comers who come to see me through the laparoscope. I can handle about 95% of people in stage 1 and stage 2. I can handle about 50% of people in stage 3. And I can handle about 25% of people with stage 4 disease through the laparoscope during successful treatment of endometriosis because they're too nonspecific. Pregnancy is uh, a complaint of only about a quarter of the patients with endometriosis. So it's a minority symptom. And the emphasis that's placed on pregnancy and uh, successful treatment of infertility uh, leads people down a primrose path. Pain relief. Since pain is the most common symptom, pain relief is the best symptomatic judge for successful treatment. Uh, what we do here is we uh, follow the patients annually with a questionnaire that asks uh, specific detailed questions about eight different symptoms. Uh, we ask them about any surgery they've had after treatment, any medical therapy that they've had after treatment here. Uh, and putting all that together into a computer, you know, coming up with some, uh, some good idea of uh, what happens to these people. And the rough uh, preliminary statistics uh, looks like 75% of patients who undergo laparoscopic excision of endometriosis have good to excellent relief of the pain. 20% uh, uh, have some to good relief of pain. And about 5% of patients either are not helped or are worse after uh, the surgery. So in other words, about 90 to 95% of people experience at least some pain relief, and most of those excellent pain relief. You the, pain, the pain relief that these people experience seems to be long-lasting. Some of these patients have been followed for you know, up to seven or eight years, and um, the, the, the line is pretty flat. Mm -hmm. You mentioned in your interview <coughs> that the first surgery is, is really important. Can you explain why? The first surgery for endometriosis is the most important surgery for that patient if the doctor is going to just try to destroy the disease, because if he can destroy the disease completely, and if endometriosis is positionally static and doesn't spread progressively, and if Samson's theory is really not operative because there's no evidence to support it uh, scientifically, then in a true sense of the word, that first surgeon has the capability of curing that patient of endometriosis. And by cure, I mean cure in the, in the true sense of the word. The woman may be rid of the disease forever. If you can identify all the disease and if you can remove it all, those are two big ifs. And uh, even though I have an eagle eye for the disease, uh, I can't necessarily claim to be absolutely perfect in all the patients I operate on in terms of you know, finding each and every little area. I think I find all the disease in most patients, but you know, no one is perfect. So if that first surgeon can do his job right, the patient has a potential of being rid of endometriosis for truly forever. That means that she would not theoretically need any f future surgery for endometriosis. With future surgery comes the potential for adhesions related to surgery, uh, risk of anesthesia, and just the intrusion into her life that surgery represents. It's interesting, the highest reported recurrence rate in the literature after conservative surgery of endometriosis is only 27%. And so I'm not sure where uh, many renowned physicians uh, get the idea that endometriosis is, is something that will always come back after surgery. 
uh, if 27% if is the maximum recurrent rate that's been quoted, there is a 40% recurrence rate at five years that uh, has been bandied about, but that uh, basically originates from an article that had some arithmetic problems in one of its tables, and I don't accept that figure. Okay. We've touched on this earlier, but perhaps you can just capitalize it. Does uh, hysterectomy cure endometriosis? Hysterectomy does not cure endometriosis. The word hysterectomy, of course, just means removal of the uterus. If endometriosis is in the pelvis outside the uterus and the uterus only is removed, that endometriosis will remain. If you remove the uterus tubes and ovaries, there is no evidence that endometriosis goes away. Uh, the only cure for endometriosis is removal of the endometriosis. Is the reason why this... Yeah. I just wonder, we had bad, uh, bad heard about having you use the word castration because yeah. you used it in your video. Do you, yeah, you did. Do you is it feel comfortable using that? I think it's a more direct. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, is a term that it can also apply to. I, I always think of it in terms of, of men, but in terms of removing the uterus and the, the tubes. Well, castration uh, means removal of the gonads, and it specifically refers to removal of the ovaries. And so, you know, if you say castration, you know, only, you're not talking about hysterectomy. So, um, a more global and accurate term would be removal of the uterus tubes and ovaries because then everybody knows what you're talking about because castration basically just means removal of the gonads. So, um, I just want to clear one thing up here about uh, removal of the ovaries. Um, it, you, you say it doesn't, it doesn't clear up unless you have surgery, you know, hysterectomy. Does. But what I wanted to ask was, uh, does it reduce the pain because the, the level of hormones has dropped? Is that, is that the main reason? Uh, re removal of the ovaries can result in a decrease of the pain that endometriosis causes, even if you leave all the endometriosis in the pelvis. Uh, presumably, it's r a result of a uh, reduction of cyclic hormonal activity from the ovaries, although we really don't even know why endometriosis hurts in the first place. Um, but many patients who have treatment like that still wind up hurting later. And since there isn't any way to predict when you're there at surgery uh, whether that woman is going to have persistent pain, it seems a reasonable uh, alternative just to go ahead and remove the disease that brought you and the patient to the operating table, not identify the disease and say, well, why remove this disease when we can remove something else? Okay, then in your video you mentioned that a lot of women actually do choose his symptoms. Why would that be? Mm. After you've explained to them that, you know, all the things you just said. Oh, you want to stop for a sec? Yeah, just for, just for a sec. Um, then why do some women choose this? Well, just because conservative surgery for endometriosis is available doesn't make it absolutely correct for everybody. Uh, many patients uh, have other problems directly related to the uterus. They may have abnormal pap smears, cancer of the cervix, fibroid tumors, severe menstrual cramps, unrelated endometriosis, irregular and heavy bleeding unresponsive to medical therapy. Uh, and so some women who, with those other problems directly related to the uterus if they're having some type of surgery for removal of the endometriosis, they you know, frequently will ask that the uterus be removed too, and I think that's a good move because endometriosis surgery will not affect those other problems. Does endo recur after surgery? Why? The question of endometriosis after conservative surgery, I think, is a question of is it persistent disease or recurrent disease, recurrent new disease. Uh, if the disease is very subtle in appearance, and if not all of the disease is removed, uh, then the presence of disease after surgery may simply be persistence of disease that was not identified and removed the first time. Um, I'm trying to get a handle on that question in follow-up of patients that I've done surgery on who have another surgery. Uh, and I'm not able to answer whether these patients have new disease or persistent disease. It seems like most of them have persistent disease if you were to back me up against the wall because the, the very few patients that have been reoperated after I've done their first surgery, uh, most of them don't have any endometriosis at all. Uh, the ones who have endometriosis usually have small amounts of disease compared to what they had the first time. And maybe I just didn't do a perfect surgery in them and missed a little bit of disease. Mm. How can you verify your success rate without performing other laparoscopy on your patients? I guess you've answered that questionnaire. 
Without, without repeating the laparoscopy on every patient that a doctor operates on, there is no way to, to know exactly what is happening to the endometriosis. On the other hand, it, it may be difficult to convince a patient who is otherwise feeling well to come back for a laparoscopy just for bona fide scientific study. Uh, and, and basically, no one is going to be able to relaparoscope all their patients. So we're left with dealing with what we can deal with you know, uh, assessing response of pain, reoperation rates, etc. And that's probably about the best we'll ever, ever be able to do. How do you feel about cauterization? It has the potential to destroy endometriosis, but it doesn't always because uh, the, the surgeon doesn't have any totally positive or objective way of knowing how deeply to burn in this area or that area. Plus, the surgeon may be understandably hesitant to burn over vital structures, afraid of damaging them. There may be a role to play with superficial disease of the ovaries, or what is thought to be superficial disease, because if you operate on the ovaries uh, they, with, with any technique, even microsurgical techniques, you risk forming a lot of adhesions. And so if you burn some superficial little lesions that you think are endometriosis, possibly that might produce less potential for scar tissue formation than actually chopping that disease off the surface of the ovary. Okay. Laser surgery. Laser surgery suffers from uh, many of the problems of electric cautery, uh, assuming that the doctor has identified the, the disease properly and is now about to destroy it. The laser surgeon really has no positive or objective way of knowing how deep to burn in all areas of the pelvis. Uh, that may not be a problem with superficial disease, but many lesions of endometriosis have some surrounding fibrosis and a little bit of uh, retroperitoneal or invasion or fibrosis and some of these people have very large nodules and it's it's very difficult to understand how laser a pinpoint light of laser you know eight tenths of a millimeter across uh, will be able to completely vaporize the depths of some of these large lesions when the depth of penetration of a single blast of laser is only about two tenths of a millimeter uh, and so laser has that that problem of how do you control the depth of burn? Again, the laser surgeon may be hesitant to burn over the vital structures in the pelvis, just like the electric cautery surgeon. Um, so laser has potential, but again, treatment failures are common for these reasons. Drug therapy of endometriosis has the attraction of not being surgical treatment, and therefore it, it avoids uh, the risk of bleeding, infection, damage to internal organs, risk of post-operative adhesion formation. And if there were a medicine that made endometriosis go away, that would be ideal because it would avoid all those risks. Uh, many surgeons, many, many physicians use drug therapy because they don't know how to do the endometriosis surgery and they don't feel comfortable doing it. And uh, that may be the best thing for them because if, at least if they're recognizing their limitations, uh, they will not be causing harm to a lot of patients that they try to treat. Uh, many physicians who treat endometriosis surgically like to treat the patient before surgery with drugs uh, in an effort to um, make dissection planes easier to develop, make the pelvis less congested. Uh, it, it's thought that that may reduce the amount of bleeding. Uh, I've uh, operated on uh, enough patients who have been on drug therapy uh, and enough patients who have been off drug therapy at the time of my surgery uh, to say that I can't really tell the difference. I am not convinced that there is a real difference in terms of drying up the pelvis with medical therapy before you perform surgery. I have a patient upstairs recovering from major surgery for endometriosis, uh, including a bowel resection for a large rectal nodule of disease, who had been on danazole for an entire year prior to her surgery. And um, uh, she lost about two and a half units of blood uh, and is somewhat anemic after her surgery. I was not impressed that her pelvis you know, was particularly dry. Now she had severe disease and blood loss is going to be inevitable when you're operating uh, on severe disease, but 